If you'd like to turn over to Deuteronomy 24, that's an Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the last of the first five, the Pentateuch, the books of the law as they're sometimes called, Deuteronomy chapter 24. And we'll read this just to kind of set the tone for a discussion that Jesus is going to have with his disciples and some of the Pharisees. Life has really not changed that much. People have not changed that much in the last four or 5,000 years. Well, I guess as long as the earth has stood, things have not changed that much. There is nothing new under the sun, says Solomon. Chapter 24, beginning in verse 1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and gives it to her and sends her out from his house, and after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man, and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from his house, or if he dies. Then her first husband who divorced her is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land, and the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Uh, I did an inordinate amount of reading last night, in particular Jack Pearl Lewis, who's already passed on, was one of my professors in Memphis at the graduate school years ago, uh, extraordinarily intelligent man, uh, just uh, an amazing scholar. So I wanted to read what he had written on Deuteronomy 24, and I learned a little bit, but I won't share all of that. Just, just to say this, when Jesus and the Pharisees are discussing, that's the passage the Pharisees are wanting to talk about. That's the trap that they're trying to. To lay. I will say a couple of things. I like that passage because it seems to give an opportunity to the woman for a better relationship. Uh, husband one was displeased with her. Uh, and that could run anywhere from she was sexually immoral to she burned the toast, depending on which of the rabbis you talked to in Jesus' era. There was a very, very conservative man named Shammai, and Shammai believed that only in cases of adultery could a man put away his wife? Jesus agreed with him. And then there was Rabbi Hillel, who was the father of Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the teacher of Paul the Apostle. Uh, his side taught that you could divorce her for pretty much anything. If you just didn't like her anymore, you could get rid of her. Uh, I always mention this. I used to live close to Waco, Texas. And in Waco, Texas, back in about 19... Oh, I don't know, 86, 87, 88, somewhere in there. We were driving down the street, and there was a sign in the front yard that said, No Fault Divorce, twenty nine ninety five. So we had gotten to that point even in the 80s where we were no fault divorce, and it was cheap to get rid of your wife. But this passage gives a little bit of protection to the woman in an era when there was not much. Uh, she's not just being hung out to dry. She's not just left in the situation where she's still married but unloved. The man was required to put in writing the marriage uh, annulment or the writing of divorcement and put it in her hand before he sent her out so that she could find another husband. And in those days for a woman to be single was a great burden and it was expected that women would be married and so she could go out and find another husband. It also protected the other husband from having the property of another man if he has the writing of divorcement that uh, his new wife has brought along with her, then he can't be held accountable for what the other man might say or do. It also prevented her from being put back into that bad situation if the man changed his mind. Uh, there is something about us as humans that is willing to accept abuse as long as someone's paying attention to us. Do you know what I'm talking about? There are people who are in abusive relationships, and when they are given an opportunity to escape the abusive relationship, they will go back. It's not because they enjoy the abuse at all. It's because they are recognized, they're seen, they're, they're part of something, 
and they're afraid that by being away from that, they'll just disappear. And so they'll actually go back to an abusive relationship. So part of that uh, is involved here. The woman cannot go back to the original marriage, which was not good in the first place. Uh, the law prevented it. In fact, it prevents it in no uncertain terms. It says that it would defile the land for the man to take back the wife that he had sent away. Uh, when I was growing up in the 70s, there were a lot of debates on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Yes, everybody remember lots of books written. One of the interesting things I found in those books is that many of them demanded, in no uncertain terms, that if a marriage had taken place for any reason other than adultery, that the original couple must reunite. That's exactly what Deuteronomy 24 prohibits. So I've always found that interesting, that that was the, the absolute answer to the question. All right, now that I've muddied the waters just a little bit, let's go to Mark chapter 10, and we'll look at this conversation that Jesus had with his disciples and a group of Pharisees. Pay special attention to where they are. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Where are they? They're close to Jerusalem. They've passed back over into Judea. They're not up in the Gentile areas anymore. They're not up near Nazareth and Capernaum anymore. They've come back down into Judea. So they've come into the area where there are lots of doctors of the law, lots of guys who are interested in discussing finer points of the law. Now, when he comes into this area, he's not just going to be teaching groups of people who are fairly uneducated. He's going to be teaching groups of people that include folks who know the law quite well. Now notice verse 2. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Why did they ask the question? It is not because they're extremely interested in the morality of it. It's not even because they're that interested in the legality of it. They want to find a way they can trap Jesus. If they can get Jesus to agree with Shammai and say that it's, all, it's only for matters of divorce, if they can, or for matters of adultery, they can get him on that end. And if he agrees with Hillel's bunch and says, well, divorce for any reason is fine, they've got him either way. So when they ask the question, it's designed to get Jesus into a difficult conversation. The only thing I can liken it to is presidential press conferences. You know who's sitting in front of you when you come out for the press conference. And you know that if you call on this person, they're going to ask you a question that is designed to get you into trouble. And if you call on this person, they're going to say nice things about you and ask you a question that's easy to answer and makes you look good. Yes? We've watched these silly press conferences. And you get... I don't know, sometimes confused and sometimes upset by that you know, constant barrage of can we ask them a question that's going to get them in trouble. That's exactly what's going on here. They're not interested in truth. They're interested in getting Jesus to say the wrong thing. So verse 3, what did Moses command you, Jesus said. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away, right? Deuteronomy 24, we just read it. That's what you're supposed to do. Jesus said, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And she who divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Okay, so Jesus comes down more on the conservative side. Uh, he answers their question, but he answers it differently than what they were expecting. He doesn't say, I agree with Shammai. He says, I agree with the created order of things. 
when man was first created, this is the way that things were. Uh, in the best of all possible worlds, we would all live in the Garden of Eden, and there would be an Adam, and there would be an Eve. Here's a few things that Jesus is drawing on when he talks about the marriage in the beginning. Number one, Adam was alone. You remember that? God creates Adam from the dust of the earth. He breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. Adam becomes a living soul, and God begins bringing the animals to Adam, and Adam names the animal. Whatever Adam calls the animal, that's what the animal will be called. He goes through all the animals, and then we have that odd little passage, but a suitable for companion for Adam was not found. So God put Adam into a deep sleep and he took a rib from his side and from that rib he formed Eve and brought her to the man. And the man said her name will be woman because she was taken out of man and then later he says her name is Eve because she is the mother of all the living ones. God made a female to go with the male that he had already created because alone was undesirable. Alone was not what Adam needed to be or wanted to be. And so God brought him a mate. At that time, there was not a plethora of women for Adam to choose from. By the time Cain gets his wife, there are probably hundreds or thousands of women from which to choose. And we don't have a problem in him finding a mate, but God had to help Adam. He had to make one specifically for him. And now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that you can can opt out of or you can an answer if you want. Number one, if you're sitting next to your spouse, I recommend that you answer in the affirmative. Did you find someone that was your soulmate? Did you find someone that God made especially for you? I like to think that when Becky was five years old, she didn't know it, but she was mine. Right? She was just growing up and biding her time until I showed up to sweep her off her feet and to take her home to be with me. We've been married 38 years last week. How many of you have been married more than 38 years? I'll even take those of you whose spouses are gone. How long were you married? You can speak in church now. What's the longest marriage we've got? 68. 68. Anybody beat 68? Having to 66, 67, 67, 68. Sold for 68. So 68 is a big number, yes? It's a wonderful number and still ongoing. Adam and Eve, we don't know exactly how many years they were married. Adam lived a long, long time. He was 900, I think, about the time he died. So he and Eve probably busted your record, but they were together a long time. We love to have someone with whom we can share our lives, with whom we can share our experiences. And that's what marriage is all about. So when Jesus talks about marriage, he speaks in terms of that very first union, the union of a man and a woman that God had predisposed for each other. There was one of each kind that he brought together. Run over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Now here's where it hits close to home. All of us, I assume... <laughs> at some time in our lives, have been lonely. Some of us wanted to be married from a young age. Right? I came from a household of long-lasting marriages. Right? My mom and dad uh, had been married for lots of years before I grew up enough to know how many years they had been married. I, I don't know how long they had been married before my mother passed away a year or two ago. Um, it just seemed normal to me. I always wanted someone to belong with. I wanted to be married all my life. Uh, and I have enjoyed marriage. I don't think I would enjoy being single at all. There are some of us who are more likely to want to be single. Some of us have been lonely at times when we thought about wanting to have a mate, but we never actually got married. Some of us have been lonely enough that we married the wrong somebody and had to deal with those kinds of things. But here's what the disciples asked Jesus a little bit later on. This is Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 8. Um, 
This is a recap. Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it's better not to marry. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this, but only those to whom it has been given. There are eunuchs who are born that way. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are those who chose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept it should accept it. So the disciples assume that if you're single, you're celibate. And Jesus says, that's fine if you can live with it. The apostle Paul makes arguments that it's better to be single as a Christian and particularly as a minister. He says, if you're single, all you have to think about is you and the Lord. If you're married, you have a spouse that you need to take care of. So there are things that you want to do for the Lord that may be interrupted by your relationship to your spouse, and that's legitimate. You need to take care of your spouse as well as have a relationship with the Lord. Helps when both spouses are connected to the Lord. That's always the best of all possible situations. But Jesus tells the disciples, not everybody can do that. Some people need to go ahead and be married. Paul makes that argument as well, that it's better to marry than to burn with desire. 1 Corinthians, you can look that one up. I think it's chapter 7-ish. But do you recognize the response? I want to give you some statistics from Pew Research on where we are as a nation currently concerning marriage and sexuality. Among young adults... And I thought young adults included the age of 60, but they don't. They include up to 29, 18 to 29. So half of us quit listening already. Young adults, those ages 18 to 29, are almost twice as likely to have cohabited as they are to have been married. Isn't that interesting? 44% have cohabited, 23% have been married during that time frame. The largest share, 48%, have remained single. So lots of up to 29-year-olds are choosing to remain single in our society. Meanwhile, among those ages 30 to 44, the share that has cohabited goes up to 71% and is very similar to the share of those that are married or have been married, 73%. So it's about equal all the way up to and including the age of 44 52% have both cohabited and been married at some point. Can you imagine if they were in that conversation with Jesus and the Pharisees and the disciples, what Jesus and the Pharisees and the disciples all assumed to be true in their discussion of marriage is no longer considered to be the normal thing. Adults ages 18 to 44 are almost 10% more likely to have cohabited than to have been married. So Jesus' answer deals with the sexuality of the thing. A eunuch is someone who does not or cannot have relationships of that kind. Uh, When Jesus says the two will become one flesh, he's talking about that deep emotional connection that comes through being partners and not just friends. Here's some more from the Pew Research Center. They ask people, is sex between consenting partners in a non-committed relationship okay? Uh, One of the phrases that's used currently to describe this is hooking up. So is hooking up okay? Non-Christians, 50% of them said it's always okay. 33% said it's sometimes okay. Okay. So if you add those together, 83% of non-Christians who were polled said hooking up is okay. Uh, When I was on the college campus, they did a um, survey among the students as to how many had had a casual relationship 
while they were on campus and the numbers would scare you. Then they asked the Christians, are you ready for this one? No, you're not. They asked the Christians, 18% of Christian young people that were asked, is hooking up okay, said always okay. Almost 20% of young people that call themselves Christians say hooking up, in other words, having non-committed sexual relationships is always okay. It gets worse. 32% said it's okay sometimes. By the way, what does it mean if you say it's always okay? That means it's okay for everybody, right? What, when you say sometimes it's okay, what does that mean? It's probably just okay for me, right? I can judge you for doing it, but I know me and it was really a good thing and they're a nice person, et cetera, et cetera, right? We can make excuses for ourselves. But 40% of Christian young people answered that casual, non-committed sexual relations are okay, at least sometimes. So I wrote down six levels of sexuality, six levels. You can add a level if I'm missing something. Number one, you've got what Jesus was arguing in the beginning, God-given marriage. The two will become one flesh, that which God has brought together, let not man separate. There is pleasure within a contract agreement. Number two, divorce followed by another marriage. Deuteronomy kind of outlines the way to go about that in their culture. You break one contract to form another contract, but you still have pleasure within a contract. Number three, divorce followed by celibacy. That's the one that the disciples were worried about. You know, if that's the way it is with a woman, then it's better just not to get married at all. And if you divorce her, then just don't get remarried. Uh, a broken contract and no pleasure. No marriage at all and a life of celibacy. No contract and no pleasure. I know brethren within the church... In fact, I've known ministers within the church who have chosen that route. Celibate all their lives. I couldn't do it. Wouldn't want to do it. Wouldn't want to think about doing it. But they chose that route. Marriage for me was a given. Celibacy for them was a given. Both working for the Lord, both doing what they feel is what the Lord has called them to do. But without a contract and without sexuality... That's fine. That's the way Paul went about life. Number five, committed relationships minus marriage. That is, cohabitation and or committed dating. Pleasure within an implied contract. Uh, if you don't know some 20-somethings who are living together, ask them about their arrangement. And you will get different answers from different couples and sometimes different answers from different people in the same couple. Typically, the girl thinks that this is permanent, they just haven't gotten married yet. And the guy thinks that this might be permanent, it just depends. Check around. We still have a over-dominance of male decision-making when it comes to this. The girl in the relationship is waiting for the guy to decide that they're not going to just live together anymore, but they're going to solidify the contract and actually get married. But it's implied, but not solidified. Uh, my favorite couple that had this situation, they lived together for three years, and then they called me and said, we're ready to get married. Would you do a wedding for somebody who had been living together for three years? Practice what you preach. I wanted them married. I wanted them to stop cohabiting. I wanted them to take on a contract and live together as husband and wife, which they are still doing and actually even have a young child now. And then number six, and this is about as far away from number one as you can get. A casual relationship for pleasure, but with no contract. That's what we're seeing more and more of in our culture. For a long time, that was okay for guys. 
The girls have now rebelled and said, we want it to be okay for us too. We don't want to be judged for being open in our relationships and doing whatever we want to do with our bodies which belong to us. Paul says, your bodies don't belong to you. You've been bought with a price. Honor God with your bodies. So we live in a culture that is increasingly contrary to what the Lord said about marriage, what his disciples thought about marriage, even what the Pharisees thought about marriage. Because marriage in our culture has become demonized. We had so many divorces between the end of the 60s and the current generation that they've looked at marriage and just said, well, it doesn't work, we're not going to do it. And so they want the pleasure without the contract. The question for us is how can we approach these young people? How can we show them what a wonderful thing marriage is, why it's a desirable contract, and remind them that the God that created them gave them the opportunity to be in that wonderful contract. Not only gave them the opportunity, but called them to it. It should be the rule, not the exception, that folks marry, and it should be the rule, not the exception, that they remain married for long periods of time. So I'll, I'll let you think about that. If I missed some areas in there, you can re-educate me. We have a lot of kids that are following us, yes? We have a lot of young adults coming up behind us. They deserve to get to have what God designed life to be. It's not easy. Sometimes it's not even enjoyable. But it's always right. And when things are right and when things are ordained of God, we know that eventually we can work in them instead of around them as the new generations are trying to do. So take it to heart, pray about it, see if you can help somebody near to you. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the institution of marriage, for the opportunity to have someone to be that intimate and that close and that connected to, for the way we help one another, for the things that, that we can accomplish together that we couldn't accomplish alone. Father, we pray for the young people around us who are confused because of the mistakes that we've made who aren't sure if your way is the right way, the best way. Father, we pray that you would help us to live our married lives in a way that would encourage them to want that, to see in us a pattern that they would want to have for themselves. And Father, help us to encourage them to search your word and to seek your will, to know how to handle themselves, their bodies, their souls, and their spirits in your sight. It's in Jesus that we ask these things. Amen. If you need to respond to the invitation this morning, maybe we can encourage you by way of a public response as we stand and sing.